what if I told you that the theme of next year's Met Gala was just announced? Super fine, tailoring black style. <laughs> Lord, y'all, y'all are sending people up to get canceled. I can just see Anna Wintour in just a big old fro with her glasses on. <laughs> Girl, y'all are sending people up. Hey, my name is Sam Sanders. Thank you so much for checking out my show. Perhaps you have no idea who I am, so I will tell you. I'm a podcast and radio journalist who has covered all kinds of stuff for over a decade. I've covered politics. I've covered breaking news and business and tech. But what I love the most is the entertainment and the pop culture and the fun stuff that we enjoy in our free time. So this show is all about that. And for this episode, I am so happy to be joined by a guest who for years has been making incredibly fun stuff for us all to enjoy and obsess over. You may know my guest as a RuPaul's Drag Race alum and winner. You may also know her as the co-host of the podcast Sibling Rivalry, along with Bob the Drag Queen. You may also know her as a political activist and a vocalist and a professionally trained opera singer. I'm talking about the one, the only Monet Exchange. Welcome oh to the show. God, thank Air you. horn, yes. all of that, sirens, lights. Okay, Bob the Dragon, which one is she? What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I love Bob. Thank you for having me. Don't this cross is, Bob. Uh, I, I will cross her. I will cross her <laughs> off and out. First, I love your shoes. Instagram so... told me to buy them, no. and I said, okay. See, sometimes it's, Instagram shopping is such a, it can be so hit this or miss. This is the thing. Everyone's always like, oh, the algorithm knows too much. It's like, if it knows the right things, I'm fine with uh, that. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Well, the, the yeah. gag is when you, like, think about a thing, you haven't searched it anywhere. And it just And knows. it pops up. I'm like, what is going yeah. on? What in the meta? <laughs> you know? Do you think the phones are listening? I, they absolutely are. There's something that like there's there's no other way that it can know that I wanted to get um that I needed a new back shaver. Like there's no way that I haven't searched for it, but it's popping up in my in my thing. Like someone is listening to something. Absolutely. Did you get the back shaver? I did not get it. I just got laser hair removal instead. You could have picked an easier option. <laughs> <laughs> you could have picked an easier option. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I want to talk to you about so much. I, I have want, so many questions. I want to talk to you about everything, Sam. Done. We're going to do it. Yes. Um, but I think to start, mm -hmm. something we quickly realized here on the show when we began to research you for this interview yeah. is that you and I have a lot in common. Do we? We're both church girls. Oh, yes, Like girl. church, church, church. Yes. How churchy were you? I was church, 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 church. So um, I, I, grew, I grew up Methodist. Okay. I met communion when I was nine. African-American Methodist? Well, um, in St. Lucia, so Caribbean, yes. okay. yeah, yeah, black, yeah, black, black Methodist, and so I grew up there. And then, but in, when I went to high school, I got part of this, the Songs of Solomon Inspirational Ensemble, which oh. was kind of my dive into my love of classical music. But the choir director there, Chantel Wright, she was really big on like. Um, teaching us about classical and opera, but also having us do like spirituals and anthems from church. Yeah. So we became part of this ensemble that we would like compete in like gospel competitions. Okay. We would go on like gospel tours around the st around the states and Canada. So so we all like the, the all of us who were in this group together would like go to church and stuff together. So then I kind of became non denominational Pentecostal throughout okay. like my high school my junior, high school years. Like, like how Pentecostal? Like I mean, speaking up in, in church, tongues. speaking in tongues. Okay. Uh, pro laid prostrate. Okay. Going to um, um, GMA, uh, the big church conference. There's so many. I know they're fun though. They are. I they are from there. Wow. Like I, I I remember I was at the conference where Juanita Bynum did this. Did, Juanita Bynum. Juanita Bynum did the <laughs> threshing floor sermon. Like it was crazy. Oh my goodness. It was crazy. I love this. Yeah. I bring it up because I was raised Pentecostal, mm. son of our Pentecostal church organist. I was in church. Okay, so are you nice on the keys? I played the saxophone. The saxophone. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Oh, so you went, so y'all so y'all church had a budget. We had because y'all had extra y'all had extra we had a uh, music. Oh, okay. We had so a whole extra, band. Okay. Y'all had y'all money. And I was there all the time. Uh -huh. And I remember it's 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 funny you talk about speaking in tongues. Uh, the first time I spoke in tongues at church, I totally faked it. Oh, every time I spoke in tongues at church, I, I faked it. 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I, which is terrible. But I, it was a thing. Like I was like, okay, I want, I want, like I can participate in this too. And now I look back, I'm like, oh my god, I totally was not. The first time they wanted all the kids to come to the front and pray and speak in tongues and like catch the Holy Ghost, and I was just tired. <laughs> So I listened to what the girl next to me was saying. I was like, let me say that too. And I got to sit down. <laughs> anywho, anywho, later on it did feel real. Uh -huh. But I bring all this up yeah. because what I found mm -hmm. is that all of the work I do now is directly influenced by the things I learned in the church. In how church? to think about an audience how to think about timing and pacing and performance. Yeah. How to like ride an emotional wave with a crowd. Yeah. I do think like a lot of church rubs off in how I do this job now, even though I'm not doing churchy stuff anymore. Do you yeah. feel some church or some gospel influence still in what you do? Um, I think maybe the way I relate to like my relationship to music, I think is a lot influenced by gospel and how yeah. I sing and like a lot of those mannerisms because you know, Again, we're just in, we're we're just so enthralled in uh, everything in church and like like my I think my appreciation on a spiritual level with music, even albeit R and B or classical music, yeah. is influenced by that love of church and like seeing like how a song can cause an entire room of people to just to bust into tears and to feel and to feel the music on a deeper connection. So I think that is at the core of what my musicianship is. Oh yeah, well, and it's like when you're in a black church, when you're at a gospel performance, the performance hasn't hit until the audience is physically involved mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. There's a call and response, yeah. there's a communal movement, yeah. and that feels very different than some other mediums and forms. Yeah. And I kind of find that like, a really good church performance or gospel performance is a lot like a good drag performance oh. because you got to get that crowd involved. Oh, this is true. And they yeah. got to be talking to you and they got to be yeah. up and they got to be with you. Like yeah. the connection to the crowd is a big through line I see. Yeah. And I also think also just the community that fostered that I fostered in church, like just like the black of the blackness of it all, like just how like I just it, because because I grew up in the Caribbean. Yeah. So my experience um was so different than African American experiences, like because I'm a West Indian American, right? Yeah. So, like a lot of the things that a lot of like like of my friends grew up with, I didn't have grow up with those same things because I grew up in a little it's like a separate country. But because we had that connectivity of church, I learned about a lot of American Black experiences, which okay. informed, you know, which made me like acclimate and 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 just understand the African American experience more because the church is such a big thing that a lot of Black folk connect with up here. Oh yeah, yeah, and it connects. It yeah. connects. Yeah. You have to do a drag performance in a Pentecostal church. What's your song? Called? I am doing "One More Chance" by um by the Ricky Dillard version. Okay, and I am deep cut girl. One more chance. Because I, I used to do that. I used to do that number in drag in New York City. Wait, really? Absolutely. You would do gospel in drag? Absolutely. Or my big one was uh 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 uh. uh Sometimes you have to uh, encourage yourself by Donna Lawrence. Give it to us. Uh, <laughs> Give it to us. <laughs> oh God. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you have to encourage yourself. So I used to do that number in Dragon. When I tell you this bar of erotic, <laughs> drunk homosexuals, how they would go <laughs> up and I would make coin. Once, sometimes I would do the number and I would like, I made my own little tip bucket yeah. called Philip, Philip D. Bucket. Uh -huh. And I would like pass it around like a collection plate and I would make bank doing Encourage Yourself <laughs> at love. the bar at two o'clock in the morning in the industry. It was insane. People I love loved it. it. I love it. And again, cause gospel music, cause Yes, these and these, a lot of people may not be religious. They don't, you know, they maybe like be atheists, whatever it is, but it's just the power and that gospel music has in it and like how it makes people connect on a, on a deeper level than yes. the text. Yeah. You know I mean, just the music of it all. Yes. It was, it was amazing. It works for everybody yeah. all the time. Yeah. Now, I also hear, speaking about singing, mm -hmm. I also hear that you uh, do opera. I do. Like, for real. How deeply? Okay. For real. Say more. When did this happen? <laughs> I want to know. Yes. So I had the privilege. I say the privilege because I don't know if it happens in a lot of the cities. Maybe you can tell me. Where, where are you from? San Antonio, Texas. Texas. Okay. So in New York City, we had, like, you could audition for high schools. Like, when I think about it, it was like. I saw fame. <laughs> fame! 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm gonna. So it, was we, it like that? Well, kind of dancing in the cafeteria, like chore- literally choreography yes. in the cafeteria. Yes, that's what our schools oh, were. So I like, there are like about ten of them, I think. Well, back then, I don't know what it is now, okay. but back then when I was at Jennifer High School, which oh my god, it's, it's like so long ago. Not, not longer for me than for you. <laughs> <laughs> but they were like American Idol style, like AGT, like you you sign up for this thing, you show up at nine o'clock in the morning and you're on this, like you're standing on a long line outside wow. and you do the audition thing. You had to do a soul fetch thing and a music literacy or competency test. And then you either get rejected or you get accepted. I got accepted to PPAS, which is the, prof- the Professional Performing Arts School, okay. which has lovely alumni like Alicia Keys. Oh, Taylor okay. Momsen, Sarah Hyland, um, Britney Spears went there for six months. What? Mm-hmm. And of oh course, the fabulous Monet Exchange. It yes. all went to this school. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And oh, yeah. Um, what was your audition song? Oh my god, it was, it was "Flying Without Wings" by Ruben Studdard. Wow. Yes. Let me tell you a name I never expect to hear in conversation <laughs> these days. Ruben Studdard, but go on. Well, Ruben. Go on. Okay, Ruben. I don't know why Ruben fell off. I Ruben had such an, a fabulous. Sorry instrument. for 2004. This is my sorry for 2004. He did. And I ain't he gonna win no more. I Yo, voted for him. I voted for Ruben too. Like I and remember when he won. Haters were like, oh, they rigged the system oh, so he could win. Girl, we Because well, they we, wanted Clay. To be fair, he was going up against like a a, a a twink from North Carolina. Like they were like, oh, we want the little twink to win. Yeah. But I was a huge Ruben fan. Yeah. So, so um, you're doing a song. I did. I, I, song. I, I did that. I guess, Flying Without Wings, got into the school. And um, uh, again, my director, the choir director there, Miss Wright, um, she was really big on, I know you guys like this pop stuff, this gospel stuff, but. I want to teach you about something else that I feel like you can love as well. Okay. And which was opera and classical music. And like before then, I had no experience with opera. I didn't think yeah. of it. But like she was really intentional about having us sing things like the Schubert Mass in G, the Fari Requiem, the Robert Ray Mass, like these things like, to teach us like this musical art form that you think is not for you is actually is for you. And mm-hmm. I fell in love with classical music then. Really? Yeah, because I just I was just so enamored by the beauty of classical music, kind of like how I was falling with, with gospel at the same time. And like, because like, you know, there is with the old guards of opera, they make you think that opera is only for rich white people. Exactly. And it's like, no, here I am, this this chubby little fat black boy from East Flatbush, Brooklyn, falling in love with this chord, this chord progression that Chopin is putting in his ballad in G minor. Like, there's just, like, I, I was falling in love with opera. And, like, I remember she showed us a performance of um, Diana Damrau singing um, at uh, doing the Queen of the Night at the Met at their 2004 production. Someone's going to fact check me. Like, no, Monet. It was actually 2000 and whatever. Anyway, mm-hmm. and I was thinking, and like, seeing, like, the drama of it. Yeah. The drama was what was, was, cool, oh. was what got me caught oh. up in the rapture, yeah. honey. Yeah. It was just yeah. the drama of she just on the stage flinging this cape. She had these crazy devil horns, and she's, like, trying to tell her daughter to kill her father with his blade to her neck. It was just the drama and the vocals of yeah. it all. I fell in love well, with it. Well, this is the thing. It's like most operas... Someone's gonna die. Oh yeah, that's in the plot. High stakes. And I mean, high but stakes. It, sometimes it can be dramatic as Lucia killing herself, or it can be like Mimi dying from a paper cut, like because <laughs> you know it can so it, it ranges. Yeah. And then so I just love how how dramatic opera is, and that's why I fell in love. What's your favorite opera song to sing? Ooh, my favorite opera song to sing. Um, people probably, uh, Drag Race fans specifically, will probably want me to say um, um, Vira Viso from Sonambla, which I sang on Drag Race. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's actually Oasis und Osiris from The Magic Flute. It's, it literally is in C major. It is such an easy song to sing. But it was, it's, it's from one of my favorite operas, and okay. it's by this character called Zarastro, this high priestess. Okay. Priest, well, I say a priestess, because I think when they do um, the drag version of it, I'm going to play him in uh, drag. Yeah. Priestess. Um, but it's so simple. It's like, oh, easy is und, oh, Siri schenket, der Weisheit Geist, dem neuen Part. Like, you're just like, it's such this low. Whoa, hold on, hold on. That piece. was, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? What just happened? <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> Thank that you. was amazing. Girl, you got me singing at <laughs> early before in the noon. morning. Early hey. in the morning. It's funny. Yeah. I was like thinking about opera, knowing that you like it. And I want to say my favorite opera performance in popular culture. You remember uh, there was a Grammy Awards in the late 90s uh-huh. where 
Pavarotti was supposed to sing, and he got sick. Uh-huh. He, was to, he was supposed to sing Nessun Dorma. And he got sick, mm-hmm. and they go Aretha. back to do the Grammys, and they're like, who can do it? And Aretha's like, that's my friend. I can do it. So they're like, are you sure, Aretha? It's opera. And Aretha goes, just let me see how he's done it before. <laughs> she watches him do it once. Then she comes on the stage and does Nessun Dorma perfectly. Wild. Nessun Dorma. And she starts out so fully. She's like, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like a little churchy, too. Uh-huh. I know. I remember the video. I what love that. It's so what good. What a time. Are we, are we, like, what a talented human being. Like, this woman has talent. And, like, the voice, she's such a great musician. Like, music, Aretha Franklin was truly one of the greatest artists of the century. So good. Mm-hmm. Another one that I think, like, is goes underrated, and I feel like when we talk about the great voices, we talk about, like, Whitney, Mariah, mm-hmm. Aretha. Audra McDonald? Yo. Undefeated. Like, Undefeated. The, this woman's voice is touched by God. It is yeah. such a beautiful instrument. I feel yeah. like we don't bring her up in a conversation enough of amazing singers. Audra, we love you. We, I love Audra McDonald. Love I you. love you, girl. All right. We'll sing some more in a bit. Mm-hmm. But I want to ask you about uh, some work that you're doing that people may not expect a drag queen to be doing, and that is okay. political activism. You have a political action committee mm-hmm. that you're a part of. It's called Drag Pack. Yeah. What is Drag Pack? Drag Pack is here with one mission, to let to get people out to the vote. And I think a big part of my mission is like letting millennials and Gen Zers know that we are the biggest voting vo- voting blocks in these upcoming elections, right? Mm-hmm. And like, so I think that I I, want, I think sometimes they hear that and like, okay, yeah, whatever. But there's so much power in that. There's so much power to really and truly affect change. Um, and not just on a major level with like you know the big elections, like you know senators and. And, and representatives and presidents, but also locally, like your alderman, your council person, like these people who are making decisions that affect you on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. The people who are making decisions about the potholes on your street that are gonna give you that flat tire for the third time this month. Like these are the ones that we should be activated on and like and 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 doing and we do the information for you. Go to the website and get all the information you need and and just we're just asking you to do the one thing, which is just take the 25 minutes out of your day of on election day to go to the place and 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 vote and do the thing okay. but so it's a, our, our our purpose is to let cuz a big part of Dragger's fans are a lot of millennials and gen z folk even though I be having some uh, uh, boomers and and Gen Xers coming the up to the show. Boomers ride hard for they, it. They do. They love the drag. Yeah. So, but obviously, a lot of our fans are younger, and you know, mm-hmm. those between eighteen and thirty five years old. Mm-hmm. So we just want to let them know, like, hey, your voice is really big, and you can make a yeah. lot of change. You know, maybe six months to a year ago, it seemed as if one of the biggest political stories in America were all these GOP sponsored bills mm-hmm. that wanted to regulate how people dress and who they get to dress up around and how people get to express their gender. They were all over the country. And it was two kinds of bills. There were, you know, bills that targeted drag performers. There were also bills that were just anti-trans and bathroom bills and such. Mm -hmm. But I clumped them all in this category of just like regulating how people present and express. Um, That was front page news for a while. It felt like six months or a year ago. And now it's out of the headlines. Yeah. I wonder what that says about the culture. Does it mean that it's less of an issue, that folks have forgotten about it? And if so, is that a good thing because folks have made peace with it? You notice this too. We talk about that less, but those bills are still around. Yeah, Yeah. I think those bills are still around. I think that, I mean, I think that a strategy that we've seen the right use is they use these moments to blow up things like the anti-trans legislation, like the anti-drag legislation. And let's also be very clear, a lot of the anti-drag legislation they pitch it as against drag queens, but if you read the language of it, it was pretty much just also just anti-trans language. They conf- it, it seems as if a lot of the language and messaging around these bills conflates the two. Yes, exactly. And which they're, they're two different, different things. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's another thing that drag pack, which we, we we try to make very clear. Yes, um, there are um, uh, trans people that do drag. But not all trans people like like that is not their experience. Drag is a job. It is a it is it is it is, it is work. Trans being 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 a trans person that is, that is your identity. Who you are. That is who you are. That's that's that is how you present the world. So we also try to be very clear and edu- educate people about that, especially the people 
in, you know, in conservative neighborhoods and from districts and et cetera. Um, but yeah, so we want to also, thank you for saying that. Yes, they're not in the headlines. We're not seeing it all, all, all the play, all over the place, but these legis leg legislations are still going forward. They are still very present and we are still fighting those and still sending, uh, Alaskan Willem did a benefit in Tennessee recently. Which had, bagged, which had banned drag performance for a while, right? Like, why? And I think that that is a that's that's something that we also want um, our conservative um, millennial and Gen Z brethren and sistren and um, siblings to so just ask the question why right like why are you trying to denigrate um, a group of people why are you trying to take away their livelihood why why are you ser like why is your purpose why are you serving to make legislation to outlaw their existence and who they are as yeah. a, as a person what does victory look like for a drag pack what does it look like to you. Oh, that's a good question. I think that's what victory. I think victory for drag pack looks like um, activating younger folk, Gen Z and millennial people, and also if, if we get some some boomers and Gen Xers too, we're very happy with that. We love you guys too. But I think it's activating those people that who and giving. Because I think even even as myself being someone who's thirty four years I'm thirty thirty four years old, I have just. I think because of 2016, I've only now been, you know, really super engaged in politics, right? Because I think for me, I'm not saying for everyone, for me, I feel like I have to. There's too much on the line for me to just turn the blind eye and be like, well, whatever happens, happens, girl. I'll live in my best life, whatever. So I think that's kind of what we want to give to younger people too. Like, it is never too early to be involved in politics. Like, this is your life on the line. This is your, these, these are your trans friends on the li lifelines, lifelines on the line. So we just want to activate them. And we don't, we're not trying to tell people who to vote for. It's not our job to make you vote for a certain candidate. We just want to give you the information and the access and let you know that you have the power to make change in your neighborhood, where that, that is on, on, on a local or state level. And that's with the local things like the anti-trans and drag legislations. If you love drag queens so much and you love watching RuPaul's Draggers and you love going and tip, tip them at their shows, then you need to also know that you can be part of the solution in helping us have long, sustainable, viable lives and careers. Do people who love you and your drag and love Drag Race, do they ever see the activist side of you and your work and your colleagues' work and say, when asked for that, shut up and dance. Oh, girl. I have, so I have my podcast somewhere with Bob the Drag Queen, and we are pretty unfiltered there. We talk about all the things, right? Mm -hmm. I remember, um, and, and on that podcast, because, you know, the wig and the ash is off, mm -hmm. um, we were like, we talk about, like, if you vote for, if you're voting for Donald Trump, like, why would you ever do that? Like, here are the reasons why, the, why this is bad. For the two people that you listen to this thing every week, here's why voting for that person is mm -hmm. bad for us, right? Mm -hmm. And we get pushback all the time, like, because, you know, because, again, because of, you know, um, uh, Palestinian suffrage and everything we're seeing in the Middle East, you know, people are people are really choosing to be against the Democrats right now and not voting for Democrats. And, and, and that is, I understand, I get it, but, you know, we are unfortunately, and I would love to in the future, I would love to, or for us to not live in a two-party system, right? I would love, I think, bitch, the more the merrier. Also, That's like seven or eight parties. You know what I mean? Like, why not? Also, why is our political system, why is it three years long? Girl, in France, it is three months of politics, it is, and it is done. I always like those Western European nations where it's like, if they just get tired of something, they'll like flip the whole parliament. But also- like, oh, Election today, Girl. we're going, well, let's Also, go. France, they're mad, they will burn the entire thing. I'm like, we are not going to work, we are tearing this all up. <laughs> Weren't they just over in France like burning garbage in the streets? Yes! They weren't playing around. But they also, they get what they want from their government, though. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. No, again, again, I'm not advocating to, to, to tear down the KCRW studio. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what we're saying. That's not what I'm saying. But I just feel like I look at those Western European countries and like, like, because I think that it is kind of draining our souls that we are living in this constant political thing. Like every, I listen to The View every day, The Daily, and a bunch of, a bunch of um, yeah. and Ponce of America and stuff. I mean, I am listening to a lot of political podcasts, yeah. I guess. But like every day I'm like, I put them on. Sometimes I'd be grudgingly listen, but I'm like, I'm trying to stay informed by the ten thousand things that happened while I was asleep last night, and I need to be conscious of so I can start so making conscious decisions throughout my day when I'm coming here. On, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just like if we live in this political system that it feels like it's never ending, but you can need to stay informed. There's so much information all the time. Yeah. What better way to make 
being informed fun than having a drag queen inform you. You know? A beautiful thing. BDE, Big Track Energy. I love it. I love it. <laughs> what are your election night plans? Okay. <laughs> So in 2020, uh -huh. Bob and I on our podcast, we Bob got the drag queen. We got Bob the drag queen. Um, Bob, if you Bob, if you're nasty, um, we on on 2020, we did um on our podcast, we did a live election watching <clears throat> with our with our patrons and listeners, which was so fun because the previous year, 2016, Hillary versus Trump. You know, I think we all went to that election and we were like, I oh, was in the newsroom that night. Oh, God. But I, I remember at the beginning, when, throughout the day when everything was coming, we, everyone, I, I mean, I don't need to retell this, so we were all super hopeful. Then as the night went on, we were all were like, and then I had to work that night. I had a gig. Um, oh, snap. And, and so I remember, but it's, my gig is what? At 11 o'clock at night. By the time I got on stage, we all knew what was the tea. And it was one of the most depressing nights of my drag career, okay? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I've, I've lost Drag Race twice, okay? So, <laughs> imagine. So, 2020, Bob and I were like, you know, if we, let's just us be together with our patrons, people who love our podcast, and things were looking good. It was such a fun night. We had, like, some people call in. We did a live stream. Okay. It was so fun. So, we want to do, replicate that again this year. Okay. But I'm going to be in Denver, Colorado, doing um, a role with um, Cop... Um, Colorado Opera, The Duchess of Crack and Wait, you're singing with the Colorado Opera? Yes. Wait, so anyone checking this show out right now in Colorado needs to know. Yes. On election night, they should just be hanging with you. Yes. We're Drag about, opera. Yes, yes. We're going to be streaming. So I'm oh. going to be running from rehearsal, back to my dressing room, streaming oh this goodness. thing. Hopefully it's a night that we will be happy with. And Bob and I will be, and if not, we're you're gonna get the real. You're gonna sing either way. <laughs> gonna you're gonna sing, sing either, way. either way. Either way. So that's the plans on election night because we have Listen, such a good fun. A fun one election don't stop no show. It won't. It, it won't. can't. It won't. I want to talk to you about some of your other work before we play a game. Ooh, I love but then I was game. realizing, where do I even start? Because you, like most drag queens, have like eight jobs is this like a general rule <laughs> that drag queens have at least three more jobs than everybody else well because as a drag you had to master so many disciplines you know what i mean like mm -hmm. so i come from i come from the new york city drag scene where yeah. a lot of our shows are like you on a microphone by yourself for two hours right mm. so it's your job to entertain this room full of drunk homosexuals mm -hmm. and queer people and do all the things. So you are the writer of the show. You're the producer. You're the dancer. You're the singer. You're the host. You're the, com you're the comedian. You're yeah. the comedian. You're so you do. You're all the bouncer that. sometimes. You, girl, <laughs> there was this video on my of, of, on my Instagram of Bob having to body slam a patron. I believe it at, in the, at um Hardware Bar one night. Oh yeah, you're yeah. probably building your own props and set. You're Literally probably doing so your, your own, own costume. Yeah, and a drag queen. I know this for sure. Y'all never have an entourage. Never. It's you with the bag. The eggs. You see, you better know it. <laughs> like, it's You work. know what I mean? So I think that <laughs> yeah. is a direct reflection of, like, how our careers go. Yeah. If, if you can show. do five jobs on stage, you can, can do, do five jobs off stage. Exactly. I ha yeah. So I'm doing, like, a bunch of different things. And also, I've been coming to terms of grappling of this thing of calling myself a multi-hyphenate because I do... Like, Why are I, you grappling with that? You actually are. Yeah, see, but it sounds so. Sometimes it sounds a little pretentious to say that. You know what I mean? Sometimes when I hear a thing that someone's saying that, I'm like, "Bro, calm down. <laughs> like it's too much." So I get to do all these things. So yeah, I, I, and also I just love staying busy. Even when I give myself some downtime, mm -hmm. three days, and I'm like, "What's the next thing?" Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm okay, like, crap, you ready bro. to go? I'm like, I, got, I want to. I want to <laughs> do another job, man. Come on, man. So you know? of all the other jobs I want to talk to you about before we play a game, uh -huh. we get we talked about opera. Actually, let's talk about your foray into R&B music. Yeah. Say more. So I've always been a very big lover of R&B, right? 90s R&B or 80s? Because there's a big difference. 90s. Okay, same. But that's because I grew up in my house <clears throat> on Sundays when we would clean. We were playing the whole, uh, the whole, I'm Aretha, I'm Aretha Franklin, um, Anita Baker album. Oh, you weren't churchy enough because we could only play gospel in our house. We did a bit in, in the mornings from yeah. between, uh, after we got home from church, okay. from like 11 to 2 was yeah. church music. Uh huh. And then evening time because we were, because we were cleaning all day. Oh, snap. It were, it was. Oh, snap. Girl, I, I guess I, I kind of went to school six days a week because we were clean every Sunday <laughs> from 11 to like 6 p.m. That's wild. I know. How big was the house? Oh, yeah. I got a three-bedroom house in Brooklyn. Right, yeah. Right. 
and then and I'm like clean cleaning. I'm like I'm like in the I'm in the bath. My the job, grout on the bottom of the toilet. My bathroom. If you don't get that, your house is not clean. My job was the bathroom, Bam. and I had to get in this in the shower. Spray the thing, the Ajax, scrub yes. the towel, get in the grout. Oh, yeah. Oh, all the things. Well, and then see, now these kids these days, they want all this. Like, we used cleaning products that were the harshest chemicals. If you stayed in that bathroom too long, you would get high. Girl. The are you fumes. Kidding? I had passed out the... in my bathroom from a combination of Ajax <laughs> and Clorox together. Yes, right? and why is it the, mom the mothers always want to add Clorox to the mix? We already got the Ajax. We already got the Pine Saw. We already got the Fabuloso. Put some Clorox some on Clorox it too. In there. What? I don't. I don't know. My mom don't... used to put ammonia, ammonia and Clorox in the washing machine. Ammonia. Are you trying to kill us, mom? Oh my god! In the... Yo. <laughs> Yo. But the clothes but is clean, though. It's so clean. <laughs> so fresh. So clean. <laughs> anyway, I totally derailed whatever you're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about music. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. we, used to, so we used to listen to R&B on, 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 on Sunday evenings yeah. and Sunday nights doing like um, Sunday dinner and stuff like that. So I've always put in love with, with R&B music. And I just love, again, I think that's where my spirit vibrates at this. Like, it's, it's so emotional. It's so emo. You know what I mean? I, it's truly that. And I just love, like, I'm the type of person at the gym, I'm not listening to, like, on the on the treadmill, I'm listening to, like, SZA and, like, Summer Walker. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm oh, listening yeah. to, like, Daphne. I'm not listening to, like, no. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. to R&B all the time. Like, I'm R&B is my base of all the time I'm listening yeah. to. So when it came to making my own music, I wanted to make music that sounds like the stuff that I listen to. Yeah. And so that's why even on my first um, project, Unapologetically, I, it's kind of a mix. I have, um, I start with this Ave Maria uh, cover I do of Ave Maria. Okay. A little, a little classical. Then I go into some some like Sylvester y 70s vibe with oh, my song Great For You. And I go into Beyonce, which is like a club dancey song. And I end with Gently, which is a very true R&B song. Okay. Yes, I love R&B. I love R&B. I also intended. love this new era of R&B with people like Victoria Monet. She's fun. And, oh, my God. She's fun. She just put out the, the part two of her, of, of her, of her Jaguar album. So good. Well, and I love how she's just like an old soul. There's one of her songs like With Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yes. All of it Hollywood. feels like. It's so good. It's like, it's unk music. It's so good. It's for the good. uncles and the aunties. It's so good. I love it. It's also just seeing her win me feel so good too because. She worked for years at it. She was she behind the scenes it. writing songs for Ariana, Ariana Grande, Grande for years. I know. For years. And actually getting her time in the we sun. We love. We love. One of my favorite things, I went to the Spotify Best New Artist Party yeah. um, this past year at the Grammys. Uh -huh. And then so I, we, I added her on it. We like became friends on Instagram like years ago. Yeah. And then so I was about to walk on the carpet and they like brought her in to walk the carpet. And then like, sh I'm sitting here, I'm standing here, she's here. I go, oh my God, Victoria, you look beautiful. She goes, oh my God, Monet. And I was like, you know. She knows. Like, hey girl. She's like, you look good. I was like, girl, you look good. And congratulations on everything. You are tearing it. Up. The Monet of it all. The Monet of the it Monet all. The Monet of Me it all. Me, her, and uh, Janelle Monet need to do something together. Heard it here first. Monet X3. What's that tour called? Oh, Monet X3. <laughs> That's the tour. Oh, sign me up. I'll work the door. I would love that. I'll do lights. Okay, you you have to come on my show, Monet Talks. I would love that. I would love that too. Dude, it's so funny. What do you so tape? Fun. We tape in Burbank. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. But, okay, girl. The I IT is there. <laughs> You know I like to get lunch at IKEA. <laughs> Do you like them Swedish meatballs? Girl, yeah, I love it to IKEA in yeah. so long. I just go to hang out. <laughs> I go. No, listen. When I was covering politics, if I had a break between covering campaign events and I had some time and I was in the city with an IKEA, mm -hmm. I would go to IKEA just to chill. I would get lunch, then I would go sit amongst the couches. I am screaming. It's very centering. I mean, it is huge, though. It's huge. It's huge. And no one bothers you. Like, there's some stores are like, what do you need? What do you want? Yeah. Ikea staff, they're not bothering you. Okay, they time. They don't have time. Girl, first of all, I'm like, I got to figure out how I'm going to take this this hushafasha home and, and put it together myself. Hushafasha. That's what they're thinking about. I love it. <laughs> all right, we're going to talk more about what else you got going on, but I want to take a break here and then come back and play a game. Is that yes. cool? Yes, please. All right, we're going to take a break. You are checking out the Sam Sanders show. Don't go anywhere. If you like this and you want more, I give some BTS. I give some behind the scenes, cutting room floor stuff in my newsletter that I write every week to accompany this show. Sign up for it and we can be in constant conversation. KCRW.com slash Sam Sanders. KCRW.com slash Sam Sanders. Welcome back to The Sam Sanders Show. 
Welcome back to the world of Monet Exchange. I love living in your world. It's got everything. It's got political activism. It's got opera. It's got R&B. It's got cleaning your house with intense cleaning products. <laughs> everything is here. Well, you're a very nice visitor at the Monet Planet. You're very nice. I like you're very respectful it. Of, of, oh. of the environment here. We appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. Uh, can I introduce some game energy into this mix? Yes. Okay. BGE, big game energy. Big game energy. Yeah. Big game that. energy. Yes. I, have do, I have to do one more. Comedy Working 3. I'll pick up another one. We love, we love, we love. So we've been trying to think of games to tailor specifically to each of our guests. Uh -huh. And our showrunner, Tyler, Tyler the Creator, um, <laughs> he came up with a really great game just for you. Okay. Uh, it definitely channels your energy. The game is called Icon or I can't. Ooh, okay, yeah, yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna bring up a topic or a story or a thing that's buzzy right now, and you tell me if this thing is an icon, which means you love it, or an I can't, which okay. means hell to the nah. Okay. Yeah? Okay. We'll go through a few. Okay. Be honest. Oh, I, I love being honest, okay. my favorite thing. <laughs> All right, let's begin. First up, is this an icon or an I can't? The Ryan Murphy Cinematic Universe. Because it's been making some headlines lately. I'm going to say icon only because. Controversial pick. Only because. Okay. Of American Horror Story 3 Coven. Which one was that? With the Angela, Angela Bassett, Bassett one. See, I didn't have to finish it. You knew it. <laughs> that, that show was so iconic. And having, having her and Kathy Bates and that thing together, it was. Can't beat it. I never watched any other American Horror Story. I never watched any of the, although Dahmer was good, actually. Was that him? You got through Dahmer? I got through Dahmer. It was a lot. I didn't finish the first episode. Really? Because, like, you know, in that build up to before his first kill, I was yeah. like, I can't, I can't, I know. I can't. I, 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 was, I watched, I like, kind of hate watching, like, what with this right? with my fingers, because it was so yeah. intense. Yeah. Yeah. I bring up Ryan Murphy because his latest show, um, has kids. been getting some headlines. He did a dramatic series about the Menendez brothers who famously killed their parents in the 80s or 90s. Yeah. But uh, after the show was released, the Menendez brothers were like, we hate this. Oh, really? This was not good to us. Like we don't it. like it. And then Ryan Murphy came back and said, the Menendez brothers should be sending me flowers. They haven't gotten so much attention in 30 years. Whose side are you on? Oh my God. Like, I believe in creative license, but Damn. was that the best response to offer to these folks that have well, been through it? Here's my thing. So, can anyone just make a movie? I thought, you, like, don't you have to get some type of legal right from the the people you were doing this? Like, can someone just I'm do it? I'm sure he got permissions. But not clearly not there. So, who's giving this permission? <laughs> I don't know. Like, so if I wanted to do a right, do, do a, 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 a movie about your life, I can just do it? The Sam Sanders movie? I'd let you. I know I'd be in good hands. Who's who's playing you? You. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm skinny and beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. So besides the controversy over this new show about those two brothers, uh, Ryan Murphy has also announced his newest upcoming show. Let me tell you what it's about. Oh, God. He loves, he's also, so many things about death and horror. He loves that. Wait apparently. for this. Ryan Murphy's next show will be a series called The Beauty. It is all about an STD that makes those affected by it beautiful. But the disease, the beauty, eventually kills its hosts. Icon or I can't? Okay, Icon, that kind of sounds good. Bro. That sounds good. <laughs> so you're gonna watch it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Okay. It sounds like that summer where that super gonorrhea was going around New York City. That's what it sounds like, but we'll see. And we all survived. <laughs> <laughs> My thing with Ryan Murphy, I think that he's obviously a brilliant creative because he's made so many hits. Going back to like Nip Tuck and Glee, yeah. he's got a record, yeah. a track record. Yeah. But sometimes I feel his work lives so deeply in trauma. Yeah. It's hard for me to watch sometimes. Yeah. But also, what do I know? I'm not making hit TV series. He is. He really he is. He knows what he's doing. He's doing he's he's tearing it up. Did you watch Feud? I heard Feud. People like Feud a lot, but I didn't watch it. I started. Yeah, I didn't watch it at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I should go back and revisit. I still my pinnacle of Ryan Murphy, first two seasons of Glee and the first few seasons of Nip Tuck. I never watched Nip Tuck. Nip Tuck is Is it a good wow. show? It's it's weird. It's about plastic surgery, right? It's it's like L.A. plastic surgery culture, Got but it. sexy. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Anywho, so okay. Ryan Murphy, 
and his universe of TV icon. icon. So like that, right, that that's needs, nice. that's, he wants to sound kind of fierce. Yeah, watch it. You gotta yeah, watch, watch it. it yeah. All right, next one. Next one. Sequels and IP reboots. Icon or I can't? I can't. Like, we have so much. <laughs> These things between our eyeballs and our ears are so powerful. Why we just keep on making, like, make some new and fun things. Like, where is the innovation? I feel like it's just so lazy. But here's the thing. I asked this question this week of you because does it change your mind when I tell you that The Devil Wears Prada 2 and The Princess Diaries 3 have just been announced? Does that change your verdict? That does change. Because when are the things that are like super iconic, but it can go hit or miss? Like, I mean, we also come into America too. Did you watch that? I did. And that makes one of us. Oh, I didn't started, watch it. I started and I said, I don't want anything to besmirch my feelings about the original, which I think is the greatest comedic film of the last half century. It, it is one of the great, I think it's one of the greatest films. I, it's so Thomas good. America is so good. And Eddie was doing the work. Okay, Eddie Murphy is Every such... single role. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. So, okay, so you are. I'm nervous. What Devil Wears Prada 2? What if they just, what if they destroy it? I'm not a Princess Diaries fan, girly, so I'm like, whatever. But Devil Wears Prada is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's one, a movie I probably throw it on in the background once as one should yeah every two months yeah so yes yeah, so i'm nervous they're gonna mess it up did you see joker 2 or whatever no, it was but Foa doli doli flop, a foe floppiana floppiana and but again also i'm like did the director want it to fail they didn't know test screening so the movie podcast i follow say that the director of joker 2 made the movie on purpose to really piss off the die hard core joker bros to make them mad People have a lot of time on their hands to do shit like and that. And a lot of money, too. I, they spent money on that movie. Poor Lady Gaga. She got cross, caught in the crosshairs of that. Let me tell you she's going to be fine. <laughs> Lady Gaga. <laughs> I bet she's all right. Joaquin Phoenix. The first one was so good. Yeah. Joaquin Phoenix ate that up, and I just had him singing show tunes in a... in a. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. yeah. So, you're, so you're generally I can't, I can't with sequels. on sequels. Although, that said, what movie would you most want to make a sequel of? If what you had movie to, what I most want to make. Oh my God. Wait, 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 wait. The notebook needs a sequel. But I it don't... ended pretty nicely, I right? I know, but I don't know if it, um, maybe, it... maybe, maybe, maybe they didn't really die. <laughs> we thought they had died. And this magical notebook actually keeps them alive and not they're like fucking vampires. The notebook, too. Vampire Boogaloo. <laughs> That's what I Done. want. Done. That's what I want in my life. I want a sequel to Soul Plane. Remember that movie? <laughs> One of the forget. dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Give me more. <laughs> Give me more Soul Plane. Icon or I can't. Uh -huh. Met Gala themes. Ooh. I can't. Only because a lot of us who just wa watching these people on our screens with this thing, sometimes half of them are not even fitting into the theme. Like, what is, what There's was never the any coherent. No cohesion there. He's like, what, what are we looking at? Yeah, like, I agree. So I say I, I agree. Okay, so you're an I can't, I can't on Met Gala themes. What if I told you that the That was theme... invited? Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what if I told you that the theme of next year's Met Gala was just announced and it might be one you like? The theme is, quote, Super fine, tailoring black style. And it's all about the visual aesthetic of what they call the black dandy. The what the, what, what the fuck is a black dandy? <laughs> Lord, y'all y'all are setting people up to get canceled. I can just see Anna Wintour and just a big old fro with her glasses on. <laughs> Girl, y'all are setting people up. And you know what's the worst part? We don't have Andre Leon Talley here to check all of them. I know. We need him back. Rest in peace, Andre. Uh, anywho, anywho, this theme, I'm going to quote from the description of uh, the theme. Drawing inspiration from Monica L. Miller's 2009 book, Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diasporic Identity, the exhibit will feature garments, paintings, photographs, and more all exploring the indelible style of black men in the context of dandyism from the 18th century through present day. And by dandyism, I think they mean like dressing up, looking yeah. good, going yeah. out, being yeah, a character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like that? 
I like it. I'm just getting nervous how all these people are going to pull this theme off. Like, that gets me very nervous. I think we're going to be looking. It's going to be It's gonna be very hairy on, on May, whatever day it is. I got a here. fix. What? I got a fix. What? For this next Met Gala, given this theme, only black people on the red carpet. <laughs> it will never happen. But... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, also like yeah, ooh, this gets me. This is this is scary. It's also very interesting for me to. Well, on the one hand, I'm happy that they're leaning into this. I think Coleman Domingo was going to be a co-chair, which is that's his very that's his style. Great. Yes, yeah. he is a black dandy for and sure. We love it. Yeah, but given Vogue magazine's iffy spotty history on race, period, I'm like, are y'all the best to execute? Having LeBron next to uh, that that lady on the, on the cover looking like he looking a big oh, like like uh, Godzilla. Godzilla King Kong King rather. Kong yeah yeah I mean there's 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 so much Countless. listen all I'm saying is Anna do your thing but you better be summoning the spirit of Andre Leon Talley every day until that gala yes burn the incense say the <laughs> prayers bring the spirit of Andre into the Met Gala <laughs> otherwise it will not work it will not work otherwise yeah what, I agree what would you wear Ooh, I would definitely work with one of my fabulous designers, probably Domino Couture, who's an amazing designer. Okay. And Domino is so good at just taking like the drag aesthetic and, and interpreting it through the lens of Monet. Okay. And he just makes me, and I, I would, something, d- definitely a suit, maybe like, maybe like a really cool version of like a, like a modern day zoot suit. I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking, you know, like before Malcolm X becomes Malcolm X in the movie. Yes. When Denzel's just like wearing those great suits. <laughs> yes. That. Yeah. I would dandy that up a whole lot. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then are you still an I can't or are you an icon? I'm an I can't still because I'm, <laughs> I'm a nervous for y'all this year at the, the Met Gala. <laughs> Anna in an afro. I'm now I'm imagining Girl. that. <laughs> we gotta move on. <laughs> All right, last one. Icon or I can't. Uh-huh. Candidates for president going on celebrity interview podcast. I can't. I mean, sorry. <laughs> I can't. I can't. You I like can't it. I get this game right. So, I'm so sorry. It's okay. This week. I can't. I can't. This Kamala. week, Kamala was on Call Her Daddy. The View. Tim Walls is going on Smartless. Ooh. A lot of folks in legacy media, legacy news are saying, eh, they should be coming on whatever. Do you feel some kind of way about it? No, because I feel like a lot of us are not watching things like legacy media. Like, you know, and so I think to reach the most people, like, Alex Cooper, I don't think people I don't think people realize how huge Call Her Daddy is. Like millions of women listen to that this show. This American Life, which is one of the all time classic OG, classic oh, we bow down. The they have about like ninety thousand likes on um or reviews on Apple. Mm-hmm. Call Her Daddy has a hundred and sixty thousand. Oh, yeah. I saw some stat that Almost said double. that her average audience is like five million people. That's insane. Yeah. So it's a huge platform for people who are digesting media when they're just at the gym or when they're driving to work, whatever, in the podcast form. So I think, and 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 it feels more like you're talking to the everyday person as opposed to, because you know Alex Cooper, call her she's not a journalist, right? And she, she says is, so. Yeah. In the interview, she's like, I, it makes no sense for me to ask Kamala about Ukraine. So she said. I want to focus on what this show is about, which yeah. is women's issues. Yeah. And what that allowed the interview to become was like a really deep dive on sexual assault, on repro access. And what I found as someone who came out of legacy newsrooms is that she was able to spend more time and go deeper. Because when you get a Kamala or a Trump in the big legacy newsrooms, they have a laundry list of exactly. questions to make sure they get through. Get through all of them. And Alex was like, no, just that. Yeah. Which kind of felt refreshing. Good. I don't I know. Love that. I haven't listened to it yet. I do okay. listen to it sometimes. I haven't listened to that episode yet. But like, for, I, I want that makes so much sense to me. And it's like you're talking to the everyday person as opposed to a, a prepared journalist who's going to give you yeah. trying to get like 90 questions over 45 minutes and just three in an yeah. hour. Well, and also the people who were surprised about this, it's like y'all do know Kamala launched her campaign as brat. Yeah. Like she's already yeah. leaned into pop culture. Leaned she's into not going to not. Yeah. Do it. Because Gen Zers and Millennials. You know? We're the big voting blocks this year, honey. Get into it. Well, I mean, we'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll see. All right. So we've landed on Icon. Icon. For Kamala. Yes. And all the other. Wait. Okay. Okay. Are you Icon with Trump on the podcast? Yes. I, like what? To do. He's on podcast. Yeah. I'm, I okay. mean, again, you have to do your research. And when you li- when, you, when, he, when he's on here saying reckless shit that doesn't make any sense, you got to be like, you know, yeah. 
But you know, if if it's if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. There you go. You know what I mean? You can't have it. You can't have it just one way. There if Kamala can do it, then Trump has to be able to do it as well. Yeah. Also, just like if you're a candidate for president, your only goal is to have as many people hear your message as possible, yeah. wherever they're at. Yeah. So they're gonna go there. Yeah. They're gonna go there. Yeah. Anywho, we've reached the end of the game, and I must declare. The winner, the one true icon of Icon or I Can't, is clearly you. <laughs> there were no other Thank contestants, you. so you win. Thank you. I was nervous for a second. Hey, I was it's like, all good. It gonna be? It's all good. Oh my goodness, we have come to the end of our time. We've talked about you. We've talked about church. We've talked about opera. We've covered some hot topics. We've done the damn thing. This, this is, is so, so fun. fun. This is so good. This I want to so come fun. back. Please come back. Okay, good. Will you drive to Santa Monica again? I don't think so. <laughs> I uh, would have to be airlifted, but I would totally come back. Uh, this public radio station has no helicopter budget. Aww. I regret to inform you. Okay, I'll, but I'll work on it. I'll give you a year, girl. This is going to be <laughs> Call Her Daddy 2.0. Listen, call her mommy. <laughs> I'm fine with call that. Call her zaddy. Hey. <gasps> call her zaddy. Call her zaddy. I'll take it. I'll take it. Oh, my goodness. All right, all right. Before I let you go, I do want to say to any folks in L.A. checking out this show right now, you can see Monet exchange in the flesh on October 24th? On October 24th, I'm performing at Hotel Cafe with a live band oh, doing music snap. for my new album, Grey Rainbow Volume 1. Okay. And along with some others, I'm, I'm doing some covers of uh, some SZA songs, so. Which SZA song? Snooze. Okay, that's yeah. a good one, that's a good so one. So y'all should come out and check me out October 24th at Hotel Cafe, it's gonna be a really good show and I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think it. I'll be there. Are you gonna come? I think I'll be there. <laughs> I'll throw a bra at you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Please do. Monet Exchange, you've made my week. I cannot thank you enough. I will see you at Hotel Cafe oh. and on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all for this week. See you next time. <laughs>